Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Why TBI Treatment is So Important for Your Client. My name is Larry Bodine and I'll be your moderator for today's program. Uh, let's go into uh, today's presenter. We'll first hear from John Zacharias, who is the owner and COO of Advantage Healthcare Systems. He's been with the organization for 26 years. He's the uh, chief operating officer and a partner. The company or the uh, systems is a multiple, multidisciplinary rehabilitation company focusing on rehabilitation of traumatic injuries, pain management, and return to work rehabilitation programs. John is a partner and co founder of MedHiwa, a medical software integrated within healthcare facilities to track patient care and outcomes. And he's also on the board of directors of Advantage Medical Clinic, an urgent care center for occupational medicine. Our second speaker will be Dr. C. Allen Hopewell, who is a neuropsychologist with Advantage Healthcare Systems. He is, uh, has a, a diploma from the American Board of Professional Psychology. Uh, he is on the American Board of Clinical Neuropsychology and is the first Texan to be board certified by examination in clinical neuropsychology. He has outstanding military career and received the Bronze Star Medal, which was awarded for his meritorial service in Operation Iraqi Freedom, and uh, he also received the Surge Campaign Star. The uh, sponsor of today's program HMR Funding is a plaintiff-oriented medical funding company located in Virginia. The company advances funds for medical expenses. And now a little bit of background about Advantage Healthcare Systems. They have eight locations in Texas and Louisiana. And their facilities are accredited by the Commission on Accreditation of Rehabilitation. It is family-owned and operated. And at Advantage Healthcare Systems, you can expect caring and courteous professionals, convenient quality treatment, and friendly service. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to our first speaker for today, John Zacharias. John, how are you today? Wonderful, Larry, and thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us today. My name is John Zacharias. I'm sitting here with Dr. Alan Hopewell. We wanted to share with you a little overview of our company, a screening tool you can integrate into your practice to help identify people with concussions and TBIs, an overview of treatment uh, that patients with concussions and TBIs can obtain, as well as an outline of proper evaluation with traumatic brain injuries. When choosing the right facility for someone with a TBI, we suggest that you find ones that are CARF accredited. CARF is an international accreditation for multidisciplinary rehab facilities. It will ensure that, your, that proper procedures and protocols are kept in place. We also suggest that the facility has a broad spectrum of providers. This allows your patients to be treated not just psychologically or just physically, but both at the same time. Make sure that your facility of choosing has a track record. There's a lot of companies out there that are fly by night. And lastly, make sure that the treatment team has leaders that are board certified. This will only ensure that your evaluations and treatment plans are held up to evidence base. At Advantage, we have physical medicine and rehab physicians, board certified neurologists, pain management physicians, psychiatrists, neuropsychologists, chiropractors, physical and occupational therapists, speech therapists, licensed professional counselors and social workers, nurses, and rehab technicians. The multitude of programs that we also offer help with the uh, continuum of care for patients. Persons with traumatic injury need to have customized treatment plans. Our programs include work hardening, outpatient medical rehab, functional restoration and chronic pain programs, each and traumatic brain injury programs. Each one of these programs include different types of providers and different focuses on treatment. Most of our programs allow patients to receive treatment from four to eight hours a day, Monday through Friday. Patient's treatment is specifically designed around his or her unique needs and goals, focusing on daily activities and functional gain. Each plan focuses on areas such as 
physical functioning, communication, cognitive therapy, community integration, and behavioral management. Advantage is located in multiple cities across Texas and in New Orleans, Louisiana. Our facilities are strategically located near international airports. We also offer overnight housing within short distances of each of our facilities. With most traumatic brain injury cases and concussions, initial evaluations are a minimum of two days. We have a screening tool that will be emailed to you that you can integrate into your intake paperwork. We have found most providers are not properly screening and misdiagnose, miss a diagnosis until later on in the patient's care, and that's if at all. Asking the right questions and ed educating the providers and patients will assist with bringing new concerns they have during treatment and will also initiate referrals to neurologists and psychologists. The screening tools cover things such as injury description, the cause, realizing greater forces result in more severe presentation, documenting if there is amnesia beforehand or after, loss of consciousness and the the length of loss of consciousness, early signs after the injury, were seizures ever observed, any deaths or injuries to others that occurred during the result of the accident. Indicators for an immediate referral include things such as seizures, repeated vomiting, double vision, worsening headaches, can't recognize people or disoriented to place, behaves unusually or confused, slurred speech, weakness or numbness in arms. So what is a concussion? A clinical syndrome characterized by, characterized by immediate and transient post-traumatic impairment of neural functions. So in English, brain trauma that affects your normal brain function. A mild traumatic brain injury, MTBI, concussions can also occur to anyone and are life-threatening. There are close to 2 to 4 million concussions per year that happen. So let's talk about what happens to the brain when somebody gets a concussion. An impact shakes the brain inside the skull. Microscopic damage can affect the anatomy and the function of the brain cells and injuries appear to be metabolic not structural which is why most scans are almost always normal. Headaches probably caused by increased glucose uh, and follow injury. Realize the magnitude of the force is not necessarily the predictor of the outcome of the severity of the injury. Most common signs of concussion or mild TBI are headaches, nausea, mood changes, confusion, slow thinking, sleep changes, and dizziness. The diagnostic tests most commonly used for concussions include CTs and MRIs, but contribute very little to the diagnosis. EEGs when seizures are present and other modalities such as the fMRI correlated with symptom severity. Other injuries such as subdermal hematoma, epidural hematoma, skull fractures, and cervical spine injuries are also commonly related with concussions as well. Common causes of mild TBI include motor vehicle collisions, falls, contact sports, being hit in the head. So when determining the best treatment for mild TBI, the treatment team should be looking for things such as what happens to the person at the time of injury. They also speak with the initial treatment physician or referring providers to give more information about the event. And attempts to make interviews with the person's family or friends, coworkers, to try to find the whole spectrum of change from the person pre and post injury. Now I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Dr. Hopewell. Thank you very much, guys. Well, thank you, Mr. Zach Ross, for inviting me, and uh, welcome to all the people participating. Uh, I'm going to run through the um, slides. Some of the most of the current research has been done by the Department of Defense and, of course, the Department of the Army, and so we have uh, updated information on uh, injuries from 
the uh, combat theaters that, that we've been associated with. I then retired from the military and am currently here uh, in Dallas, but I'll refer, be referring to or Fort Worth, Dallas-Fort Worth area. I'll be referring to some of those uh, uh, research findings as we go through. Uh, at the end of the participation here, you've already been through some of this, but you'll become familiar with basic neuro, uh, anatomy and electrochemical function of the brain. As Mr. Zacharias indicated, some of the injuries are not necessarily um, in moderate concussions, not necessarily in terms of physical damage to the neuronal structure, but in terms of disruption to the electrical activity of the brain or the neurochemical activity of the brain. Um, you also have working knowledge of types, mechanisms, and the causes of uh, brain injury. And also, we've been uh, through a slide on this, types and number of providers that compromise a typical TBI team. These are typical uh, types of brain injuries. What uh, people are mostly familiar with are uh, either penetrating injuries or blunt closed injuries from fall or motor vehicle accidents, penetrating sometimes gunshot wounds, stabs, fragments. Uh, occasionally you see crush injuries. Those are more rare, but uh, those happen in industrial ac accidents. And explosions and a blast also happen in industrial accidents, but uh, we've had particular attention to those with blast effects with, with the military uh, in the uh, past few years. The most frequent um, probable accident that happens outside of cities like New York are motor vehicle accidents. In New York City, uh, interestingly enough, the most frequent accidents are uh, assaults and muggings uh, because most people don't have cars and because of the nature of the city. So it's interesting to look at different patterns of injuries as we go about the, uh, the country. The uh, severity, the, there have been a, a large number of proposed methods to divide injuries. The one thing to keep in mind, uh, kind of a common saying about brain injury is, if you've seen one brain injury, you've seen one brain injury. The reason is that the brain injuries differ um, uh, so much in severity, type, the cause. They're also happening to individuals who vary in terms of educational level, uh, mental health, physical health. So it's difficult to come up with classification systems for these injuries. However, this is a relatively common one with the mild injuries being classified mostly as concussions or now with uh, DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5, as mild neurocognitive disorders, mo uh, moderate and severe uh, injuries based on uh, loss of consciousness, post-traumatic amnesia, and Glasgow Coma Scale. The Glasgow Coma Scale was introduced by us at the uh, University of Texas Medical Branch from Scotland, and you'll see the numbers here. It's uh, the high number 15 is a perfect score. Uh, the worst score is number three. So these are scores when you look at the medical records, uh, you'll normally be looking at the emergency uh, records, emergency room, your ET, emergency technician, or EMR records to see if they gave a Glasgow Coma Scale. That's an, a measure of at the time of the injury, such as motor vehicle accident, how conscious the person was, how they were able to respond to commands, and how disoriented they were. So those are scores that you really want to look for, and you'll, you, you'll frequently see those. LOC stands for loss of consciousness. The most frequent research has shown that uh, individuals don't necessarily have to have a loss of consciousness. With the blast effects, we have most of our folks actually have an alteration of consciousness. So loss of consciousness, alteration of consciousness between zero and 30 minutes is uh, with the milder injuries and on up to uh, loss of consciousness for greater than 24 hours. PTA stands for post-traumatic amnesia, and this is the ability to um, remember things after the accident. So frequently a patient who's had a significant head injury will say, I, I can't remember the next day or two, it was fuzzy to me. These are uh, functional MRIs, which show uh, areas of the brain that are typically damaged in brain injury. If you notice the blue uh, on this slide, these are the frontal areas of the brain that's on the um, uh, brain slide on the left. And on the left side of the side, you, you see blue. On the right side of the brain is the occipital area, which is the visual cortex. Those areas are typic typically uh, more vulnerable to being injured because of the way the brain and skull's constructed. Uh, on the slide, or the, the brain on the right up top, you'll also see the uh, uh, a little uh, 
the frontal area and then the area next to that's a temporal lobe. Uh, that's also frequently damaged. And that area is uh, critical for memory function, uh, processing of information. So as we look at the types of injuries, the reason that we as doctors need to know not only medically where the injury occurred in the brain, it also gives us an idea of the type of cognitive function that would be disrupted. So uh, for example, if a frontal, frontal lobes are injured and a person has more uh, executive function uh, difficulties, which we'll explain in a minute, then that would correspond with that particular part of the brain. We know that that happens frequently. So that, that we're not only putting this together logically to make sense of what happened to the individual, but we use that inf information in making a proper diagnosis and then turning that information into a treatment plan for the treatment team. Uh, as I indicated before, sometimes we see penetrating injuries, and these can occur in a variety of uh, interesting ways in the civilian population. Here's a, a similarly in a, in a military population. Uh, since I talk about the military population, I was the uh, uh, Defense uh, Veterans Center liaison uh, from the Department of Defense to the Army for this research. And we looked at brain injuries, uh, actually collected information on brain injuries back in the 1980s when I was first on active duty. I had uh, different times I was uh, on active military service. And we had that information compared it to several years, both before the Iraq War and during the Iraq War. And the bottom line is that we had as many uh, brain injuries during non-combat periods of time in the military as we did during combat. Uh, you, you would think that you would have more injuries during combat, but um, there are a variety of factors that, that uh, go into that, which I'm not going to go into now. But the point is that even in peacetime, soldiers will have a variety of traumatic brain injuries. And you can go to the next uh, slide here. And this is an example of an interesting one where somebody got hit by a golf club. Um, I don't know what the uh, uh, background story of this is, but uh, this is certainly a brain injury, and it will cause um, a number of problems that we need to assess with our neuropsychological evaluation, our medical evaluation, and then have a treatment plan for it. With a concussion, which is a closed head injury, the, the, the skull's not been penetrated, but it's a closed head injury, um, what happens is Mr. Zacharias indicated there's a uh, uh, mismatch of glucose metabolism. The brain runs on two things. It runs on sugar, which is glucose, and it runs on oxygen, which burns the sugar. Um, the uh, uh, initial impact uh, damages the brain so it can't burn uh, glucose, so there's a mismatch, and that metab metabolic problem will last for about two weeks. The reason of this particular slide is that we think that there's a period of vulnerability within two weeks where a person is exceptionally vulnerable to uh, a second uh, head injury or repeated head injury. So this is particularly important in your uh, sports injuries or even in uh, a motor vehicle injury where somebody sent back to work too early and may uh, uh, run the risk of the second injury from either a car accident, industrial accident, something like that. The, when you, especially when you read about military head injuries, you get the impression from the, uh, from the, the, the media that this is a, uh, uh, a condition which kind of hasn't happened before. We're learning about these for the first time, um, and so and so and so. That's not true. We're learning a lot more about them, but head injuries have been around as long as people have been around, of course. And uh, this is an example. I've got two reasons to show this. But uh, uh, Freiherr Manfred, Manfred von Richthofen was, of course, the famous Red Baron. And most people are not aware that he had a head injury, and he also had post-traumatic stress disorder. But he was uh, killed uh, in his last mission from flying over France. And you can go to the next slide. This is a uh, research project that was done by, uh, published in Lancet, which looked at the brain injury. They looked at his medical records. Uh, his doctors told him not to resume flying uh, from his injuries. He uh, went against their recommendations and did that. And um, also part of the reason that he was shot down was he wasn't paying attention to where he was going or what was happening around him. So this illustrates not only um, the, the effects of a head injury, but people with emotional um, uh, overlay that's happened with an injury or life-threatening uh, condition and also returning to an operation. In our case in the civilian world, 
This would be somebody returning to motor vehicle uh, uh, operations too soon or industrial mechanical operations too soon or something and being particularly vulnerable for further injury or even death. And of course, he actually was killed because of uh, his problems. If he'd obeyed the doctor's orders, um, things could have turned out much differently. Interesting historical case. Now, <clears throat> DSM-4, I mentioned uh, DSM-4 has uh, difficulty or there's difficulty in uh, categorizing some of these injuries. And DSM-4 is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the, the previous one. We now have DSM-5. Uh, it had actually proposed uh, uh, a new category, but in DSM-5, what they use is minor neurocognitive disorder, which um, seems to be okay. It doesn't really uh, address post-concussion directly and can be applied to other medical problems. Uh, ICD-10 actually has a specific post-concussion uh, diagnosis. This can create some problems, and three or four years ago, in um, Given a deposition with uh, uh, defense attorneys, I thought they were going to pretty much have a heart attack uh, during the deposition. I really did because I refused to accept the learned treaties proposal to DSM-4 and inform them that we knew more about brain injuries than DSM-4 did. We were the ones contributing to the uh, definitions, and they didn't. They, they had a hard time understanding that was possible. But uh, DSM-4 was uh, the committee which did this. Uh, of course, it was several years ago that thinking was older, and that's uh, what the update is now to DSM-5 or to ICD-9 and trying to get uh, better diagnostic categories for this. And here's your uh, ICD-10 uh, diagnosis of post-concussion, just a different way to classify it with a different, different diagnostic uh, system. ICD-10 is just a, a separate system from uh, D uh, DSM. I thought I would include this slide to give the audience an idea of neuropsychological assessment. We saw uh, some functional MRI slides before. We saw an x-ray of a person with a golf club in their head. Uh, what can that tell you or tell us about the problems that the individual has? Really, it can't tell us very much. As Mr. Zach Zacharias indicated, a lot of times the medical uh, uh, testing or x-rays or MRIs or CAT scans are relatively normal. The neuropsychological assessment is really the, uh, the strategy which tells us uh, how severe an injury is, how uh, the pattern of the injury, if the pattern of the injury is consistent with what we know neurologically about, about the brain, as, as I indicated earlier about frontal and temporal lobes, and also about what's needed for treatment and to help with the treatment plan. This is an example of a test that Dr. Levin and I had developed at the uh, medical branch in Galveston. It's a uh, memory test in which an individual is able to store information and then they're requested later on to retrieve it from uh, storage. Everybody's uh, had this happen to them. If you know that if you meet somebody and you know their name, you just can't remember it at that time, it's on the tip of your tongue, then that information has been learned. It's been stored in, um, in, in the, the brain centers, but you're having what we call a uh, storage retrieval error. You can't pull it up out of storage at that moment. So that's important in terms of treatment planning. And this is a particular individual who uh, not only could not store the information to begin with, but couldn't, if you can't store it, you can't retrieve it. So this individual can neither store nor retrieve the, uh, the information. The blue and red uh, lines at the top are uh, the normal curve for a normal population that has not been injured. And in this particular case, the treatment plan would be to, for the team to work with this individual on, with significant memory problems and restructuring the environment, helping give them cues, ways to retrieve information, and so forth. The neuropsychologicals also were done um, at some period of time, uh, kind of like a, a taking a picture, and so that also needs to be um, kept in mind when, when an assessment is done. Is it early in the injury, later in the injury? Uh, in the military, of course, we had uh, almost all of our soldiers who had been uh, exposed to blast uh, effects had stress uh, reactions, or some, not everybody had PTSD, but many did. Certainly they had stress reactions. In a military population, you also have stress from 
uh, repeated deployments, other things. So this slide simply uh, indicates that with a concussion, as the symptoms from the concussion start to decrease, the neuropsychological is administered at a particular time, but the emotional symptoms are still high. Uh, so we take that into consideration in trying to sort out what emotional factors are, are happening, what neurological factors are happening, and also in terms of your uh, legal case or planning a treatment um, plan, you can't separate those. We can't uh, uh, um, pretend that, that those don't exist because all of those factors will affect the progress of the patient. Uh, also, people frequently don't look at other factors, and that's the other reason we have a, uh, a good rehabilitation program, which has a good team of uh, medical and, and, a, and a wide variety of uh, professionals on it, because um, brain injury doesn't happen just by itself. Brain injury happens to an individual, and this was uh, based on research that we had in Iraq. Uh, we had, uh, uh, of course, uh, significant heat cumulative stress there, uh, which you don't have in a typical civilian population. But the rest of this pretty much applies to uh, our populations that we'll see here. Mm. With our older patients, we'll have sleep apnea, uh, sleep, uh, sleep disruptions. We may have stress, depression uh, with the civilian population. Of course, civilians may have attention deficit disorder before they hit their head. Uh, people have limited psychosocial support. Chronic pain is one of the major issues that needs to be looked at in a rehabilitation program. Uh, patients also get sicker, get more stress, and their immunological function decreases. So these are all uh, comorbid or complication things that need to be looked at in the treatment program. Um, I've always wanted these types of uh, concussions to be adopted. Um, they haven't been so far, but I think they're good ones in that, uh, again, concussions are not um, um, of one type. We've got apple concussions, orange concussions, grapefruit concussions. But um, when we look at type 1 concussions, these are uncomplicated. They're usually a single uncomplicated concussion where uh, the person's transiently or has a cognitive changes for a while, but then it goes away and it resolves. Uh, most of our milder injuries are like, uh, like this, and most people don't come in and complain after, the, after their symptoms resolve. We did um, the, the initial uh, brain injury studies at the medical branch uh, years and years ago, and taking concussions that came into the emergency room, we had a hard time following them up because some of them wouldn't come back, they'd, they'd get better. So this is your type one concussion. Your type two concussion, uh, type twos and threes are the ones that we're going to typically see in a rehabilitation program and your type 2 concussion is complicated by emotional factors. In a civilian population, this is typically someone who is working, they've lost uh, their job or they're not working now, they're having financial uh, stress that's building up, uh, perhaps family stress. So they've got the brain injury, but they've got the other emotional factors which are uh, affecting them also, and those have to be uh, treated or taken into account. Your type 3 concussion is also uh, what is typically seen in a rehabilitation program and that's complicated by other medical factors. I mentioned some of those, but um, they could be uh, post-traumatic seizure, tinnitus, uh, retinal deterioration. Headache is typically your most frequent symptom that's uh, seen after a head injury. Uh, tension deficit uh, could be complicated by other uh, problems such as chronic pain or um, starting to use alcohol to uh, of course, you see this with uh, uh, veterans and soldiers uh, uh, to some extent using alcohol to treat their symptoms and then get into an alcohol-related um, problem, which, which uh, again, has to be treated if we're going to treat the uh, underlying problem of the concussion. And this is a uh, <clears throat> positron emission scan. Uh, positron emission scan measures the uh, function of the brain. So it's actually metabol metabolic uh, activity of the brain. And these areas are lit up, so they're, they're, they're basically uh, firing in an uh, abnormal fashion. And this is simply to represent patients who have pain problems. And so if your brain's not functioning, uh, now this is not a brain injured patient, but if your brain's been damaged and not functioning well, and then you have a comorbid pain problem overlaying it, 
then you have additional dysfunction to the brain itself. Uh, this is just to illustrate that people are not just complaining of pain, but the pain is actually a neurological uh, syndrome, uh, one which affects brain functioning as well, and which will exacerbate other symptoms. So it, it, it has to be addressed. Your type four con uh, uh, concussion is also one which is frequently seen in a rehabilitation uh, setting, and that's one which uh, people have had a, a couple or more uh, types of concussion, so it's a cumulative uh, concussion. Um, and we had a, a picture of Howard Hughes here. I took it, we took it out because of time constraints, but Howard Hughes, everybody's familiar with him. Uh, Howard, but people are not familiar. Howard Hughes actually had at least two brain injuries from two different uh, aircraft accidents that he had, and he had uh, unusual personality characteristics before that. Those became exacerbated afterwards, and Howard Hughes is an example of someone with a cumulative concussion and then with psychiatric problems that have to be dealt with. And uh, type five uh, concussion is actually not a concussion, but it's uh, you know reported injury, which is more of a factitious dis disorder, dissimulation. And unfortunately, we see some of those occasionally uh, with an attorney population. You'll certainly want to rule these out and <clears throat> deal with these the best you can. And as a neuropsychologist, we would want to identify these and treat them more psychiatrically. But these are people who have a concussion that have um, either an unusual reaction or one that's uh, not really, uh, they're, they're, they're resistant to rehabilitation. It's more of a psychiatric re reaction. This is an example of a patient that I saw a few years ago who was on a shopping trip to Mexico. She was buying <clears throat> clothes for, um, I think, the Dallas market in, in Dallas and uh, slipped and fell from a, she was putting stuff in a Volkswagen and fell on her rear and hit her elbows. And um, something about she was putting the stuff and, and kind of slipped from the car down, down to the pavement. Uh, came in for a neuropsychological examination. She's actually requested to copy the design which is in the middle at the top of the uh, uh, form here. It looks like a, a big square with triangle and a pointy nose on it. And this other mess all over the page is her uh, purported copy of this. Well, this is not possible. People don't do this. So this is a psychiatric uh, response to uh, a neuropsychological question here. And of course, we routed her into proper uh, psychiatric care. But this is an example of a factitious disorder that we would want to screen out on our on our uh, uh, assessment. And <clears throat> that was the last of uh, the series of my slides. So I appreciate your uh, uh, attention to the medical portion. That was very practical, very useful. Uh, we do have a couple of questions, which I'm going to get to now. Let's see here. We have a, a question from uh, Paul. Uh, he asks, uh, the emergency providers in our area always seem to always only perform an x-ray or CT scan to diagnose a concussion following a motor vehicle crash. What can we do as attorneys to get the client properly treated? We practice in a state that does not allow attorneys to pay for medical expenses. This is Dr. Hopewell. Again, the, the, the reason the medical professionals will do an x-ray and a CAT scan is uh, obviously to rule out a skull fracture. And also the, the CAT scans are good about showing bleeding in case someone's had an internal bleed into their head, which, of course, can be fatal. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't know. It's the same as having internal bleeding in, in, in the rest of the body. You have to check after an accident to ensure that's not occurring. Other than that, th those scans or x-rays are practically useless. And so uh, going down the rabbit hole of getting increased scans, unless you're willing to pay uh, really a lot of money for a, a, what's called a defense, uh, I mean, a diffuse tensor scan uh, is, is not going to give you much. The neuropsych again, the neuropsychological examination is, uh, and screening is the, probably the uh, area that's going to give the most information about changes in behavior, changes in thinking, and collateral information, as uh, had been indicated before, talking to family members about uh, changes in behavior, personality, and things that other people haven't noticed. Uh, when I was the uh, uh, director of the brain injury program for Baylor, for Baylor Rehab for years, and in that program, we had a lot of youngsters who'd been in car wrecks or accidents. 
And it, it, just to give an example, it's fairly typical to uh, talk to a brain injury survivor who's having trouble in school or work, and the subject of brain injury never comes up. We would then ask them, did you ever have this type of injury? Oh, yes, uh, yeah, uh, I was in that car wreck, uh, you know, 10 years ago, and they put me in the hospital, and then the doctors told me I was okay. And so nobody thought anything about it. So the history and other people uh, getting other family members' information about history is critical to see if the injuries have happened and to look at their descriptions of personality changes, school or work changes, uh, cognitive changes, and then the neuropsychological assessment together is going to give us the data to document that as opposed to a MRI that just looks normal and tells us there, there's no um, you know, tumor or no vascular bleed in the brain. All right, a couple of follow-up questions, Dr. Hope. Well, uh, this was a question from Scott, one of our attendees. He asks, is the MMPI a valid diagnostic instrument for a TBI? I have heard that it only tests for psychological conditions, not the type of cognitive impairments caused by a TBI. Well, <clears throat> the answer is uh, yes and no and definitely maybe. <laughs> uh, the MMPI is a tool. It, is, it was designed and is primarily a personality assessment tool designed uh, back in the 1950s, so it's been around for a long time. To answer the question specifically, Lloyd Kripe was um, director of the neuropsychological training for the United States Army, and he and I researched this years ago, this specific question. Um, the MMPI by itself is not going to diagnose a TBI or uh, give you any any uh, specific cognitive information, but it will reflect on certain uh, scales. There are scales that reflect uh, uh, somatic symptoms. I have pain, I have headache, I have this, I have that. Other scales reflect disorganized thinking, um, obsessional thoughts that occur with brain injury, anxiety states, and so forth. So the answer to the question is that brain injuries, people with brain injury can be administered an MMPI if it's done by a neuropsychologist who knows how to interpret it. Otherwise, um, scale 8 or 1, which measures in, in typical uh, case schizophrenia, is going to be misinterpreted and somebody will be diagnosed as a schizophrenic when they're not. Uh, when with a brain injured person, scale 8 is uh, really measuring cognitive disorganization, uh, my thinking is fuzzy, Sometimes I can't focus my attention. Sometimes I have other thoughts. The patient's answering those types of items. So the MMPI can be useful, but it needs to be uh, given uh, with someone who's familiar how to use it with, with this type of patients. And uh, in addition to the MMPI, the cognitive portion of the exam should be given. Those are intelligence tests, specific memory tests like the one that I showed you, um, attentional tests, and so forth. All right, and we've got a, we're getting a, a number of questions. Uh, the next one is from Adam, and uh, he inquires, uh, what are the modern proof tools when the MRI is negative uh, that were referenced in the seminar? Which I think is a, a, another way of saying, you know, <clears throat> what reports can you offer into evidence when, um, you know, a scan, you know, shows no injury? From, the, uh, from a neuropsychological standpoint? Uh, basically, all the uh, rehabilitation uh, information can be entered into evidence. Certainly, the neuropsychological assessment, um, information from your speech pathologist, your occupational therapist, um, other people uh, that are involved in working with the patient. So those, those, that's all information that can be enter, entered into evidence. And typically, um, what an attorney will do will be, get, will be to get all of the medical records the neuropsychologist will review that as part of the background history of the examination, then include the uh, results of the examination, which will demonstrate the injury. And uh, most people these days understand that the CAT scans and the MRIs are typically not going to show anything. Uh, that's, a, that's an easy uh, learned treatise um, argument or, or professional argument to make is that uh, if you're going to look, it's kind of like the old uh, um, joke about the person who'd been drinking too much and lost his keys and he's looking for them around the uh, light pole. So some people come and help him. They say, well, how long have you been looking around the light pole? I've been looking for two hours and you haven't found him yet. 
well, why are you still looking here? Well, because the light's better. Uh, you simply have to look in the right place. Uh, so an MRI and a CAT scan is just, it's looking in one place. The place is very limited. Uh, that other data are the data that will be entered into your, um, your case and will back up the um, uh, proof of the injury and the functional deficits that the person has. All right, and then we have a question from Don, who asks, uh, would a client who, is already, who already has pre-existing conditions with sugar control problems, such as hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia, would they be at further risk for greater complications with concussions, given that it is a glucose problem? Yes, that, that's, that's, that's correct. They would have more of a, be more at risk to have problems. Uh, also, with uh, sugar and diabetic problems, uh, if those are, uh, even if they're treated and managed well, but certainly if it's not managed well, will eventually over a period of time start to cause some damage uh, to the brain. So then another injury on top of that will create additional damage. And again, that's something neuro that the neuropsychologist would take into uh, account. Uh, it, it's difficult sometimes to parse out. Usually it's, uh, unfortunately, it's not possible sometimes to say, well, 10% of the, their problem is due to glucose, 10% to this injury, 10% due to they had ADD when they were a kid. It's, it's difficult to sort everything out, but the best we can do is with a neuropsychological examination, which can be aware of those factors and address them. And, uh, of course, in a, in a legal sense, you almost have a uh, um, egg, you know, a, a truck with eggs scenario where the person was injured and there, there were more at risk for being injured, just like your, your truck, which is crashed and had a, a cargo of eggs. Well, the eggs are more uh, easily destroyed, but they're still destroyed, and that's uh, part of the part of the uh, tort, part of the injury. And uh, with that, I don't see any uh, further questions. I just want to say thank you very much, everybody, for joining, and hopefully we can see you next time. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, appreciate all of the presentations and uh, all of the questions from the attendees. And with that, I'm going to conclude the program. Thank you very much, and have a terrific day. Bye-bye.